Uh, hello. Uh, good morning, afternoon or night, depending on where you might be around the world. Uh, on behalf of EMD International, I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar on Mesoscale Data in WinPro 3.0. I'm Nathan Curry from EMD International, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, your presenter will be Lassa Svenningsen, also for, from EMD International. Uh, there are a lot of new changes in this new version of WinPro. Um, therefore, we've been having a series of webinars each week uh, for the last couple of weeks and for the next couple of weeks as well, covering the more in-depth changes. Uh, here today, we will be covering the additional mesoscale functions in WinPro 3.0. Um, the presentation should take, uh, I don't know, roughly about 25 minutes, and there will be a short question and answer session at the end, followed by a very brief survey, uh, in which you will get the opportunity to request 12 free credits, which are good for one year of EMD WARF on-demand mesoscale data in WinPro 3.0. So please hang on to the very end for that. Um, we ask that you submit any questions you might have in writing in the questions section to the bottom of your go-to interface. Uh, you can expand the questions section by clicking the little plus symbol just to the left of the word questions, and then type uh, your text in the window that appears there below it. Um, questions will be answered during the Q&A session at the end, not during the presentation. Uh, questions will also not be accepted once the Q&A session has begun. Uh, however, if we do not get your question, don't worry. We will be sending out a link to the Q&A summary of all questions, uh, as well as a, a link to the recording of this webinar to all attendees uh, within the next 24 hours. And so now I hand you over to uh, hand you over to Lassa Svenningsen. So please take it away, Lassa. Thank you, Nathan. And. Uh, Welcome everybody. So um, this is what I'm going to uh, <clears throat> address in today's presentation. So first we will have an overview of the uh, current mesoscale data that we have available in WinPro 3. Uh, then I'm going to show you how to uh, access and use these data. And uh, I'm also going to show you some theory on uh, how these data can be used in, in downscaling. Um, and at the end, I'm going to show you some validations, both validations done internally here at EMD, but also some external validations. Um, so first, let's have a look at the data sets which are available uh, right now in WinPro 3. So uh, all data sets are run in-house on EMD's computer cluster. And with WinPro 2.9, we released the EMD convex mesoscale data. This data set is a pre-run data set that covers more than 20 years at a resolution of around three kilometers with hourly uh, data. So it's a subscription uh, which costs you 1500 euros uh, for one year and that will give you free and virtually instant download because it's a pre-run data set. Um, so the domain covers uh, Europe uh, approximately and uh, for making the data uh, the era interim data has been used as the global boundary conditions and uh, the USGS uh, land cover model. So the data is updated um, as the era interim data permits so we cannot update the data before we have the era uh, interim data and usually they lack uh, around uh, one to three months uh, and we only need a couple of days to, to, to process it. So, um, so far we have more than uh, 100 subscribers to, to this data set and uh, typically more than 800 downloads uh, each month. So it's been uh, very well received, this data set. So with WinPro 3, we've also released the EMD uh, WARF, which is an on-demand service. Um, so which means that typically you will have to wait uh, some hours to get your data because it's, the calculation is actually run on demand. So the, the price tag on this service is that you need to buy calculation credits and one credit is valid for one month of calculation and costs two euros, which means that if you want to uh, buy a 10 years time series, uh, it'll cost you 240 euros. So because it's an on-demand service, the coverage is global and you can um, order a series up to 35 uh, years back. Uh, and at a resolution again, three kilometers and, and hourly. 
So there's an option, you can choose whether you want ERA interim or MIR as the global boundary conditions and the land cover model is, is globe cover. So this setup is, is optimized uh, slightly compared to the, uh, to the EMD convex and so we have also uh, a few more uh, parameters uh, which you can access. Again, the, the updates, uh, the update frequency is, is determined by which uh, global boundary data set that you choose. Again, here that will be a couple of months, whereas MIRA is typically updated uh, faster than, than, than one, one month. So, um, with that overview, um, I'm going to show you how this uh, works in, in WinPro. So, we'll look at the license, uh, how to download EMD Convex, how to start the on-demand service and download it. I'll show you some of the parameters and some special features that we include in the EMD Mesoscale data. And at the end, I'm going to show you a very easy way of doing downscaling via uh, the StatGen. So uh, let's open WinPro 3. And by now, uh, some of you, hopefully uh, most of you, are familiar with the new WinPro 3 interface. And so you see here, I have a uh, project amassed at the Danish west coast. And uh, I'd like to download some EMD convex data. So first, I'll check if I have uh, a valid license. So I go to data and models and you can see I have a green mark here for the EMD convex data. So I have a license. And to download the data, it's very easy. I simply select a MIDI object and I click at a point of interest, in this case my mass position here on the map. And I click go online. Then I get a list of the available uh, online data. I select EMD convex and I check for coverage. And then I have to choose the uh, preferred grid point. In this case, I'll take the nearest one, which also has a similar distance to the coastline. I click OK. And I have a license check here. And I accept the terms and conditions. And you can see I get down to back to 1993. I click OK. And now the data is requested uh, at the server uh, and then in a short while it will start downloading and loading into the, um, the Meteor object. So what is it actually that it's, that it's loading? So um, the, the preloaded data uh, is um, wind speed and direction for the heights 10, 25, 50, 75, 100, 150 and 200 meters. Uh, you also get preloaded temperatures at 2 meters and 100 meters. But there are more uh, parameters than that. And to access those data, I can show you in a, in a brief while where you see those. You need to go to the import setup and import those. Uh, and then you can add them at, uh, as signals. And those additional uh, parameters include turbulence, intensity, um, heat flux, and, uh, and various other uh, climatic parameters, such as uh, visibility. And as you see now in a, in a very uh, couple of seconds, it's now downloading uh, and loading the, the final series. So now we have the, um, the Mitchell object downloaded. Um, and one thing that we, uh, we have to notice here is also that there's a tab called Meso Terrain, which actually means that the Mitchell object comes with uh, the terrain, uh, the roughness uh, and the orography used in the mesoscale model and this uh, is quite important for the later use in downscaling. Um, and if we go to the data and the import setup, you can see that there are multiple parameters down here which you can add, which are not added, uh, and this will give you access to, to those parameters. So let's just click OK now and go to objects. So now we see that we have our Metro object and let's reopen it. By the way, if, if, you, uh, if you have already downloaded EMD convex data and you do open it again, you see this refresh online data. If you press this button, it'll automatically go up and check with the server if there are more recent data and download those data. And if you have uh, the, an earlier version of the data set, it will also download the mesoscale terrain and roughness and add that to the milieu object. So this is a new thing added in WinPro 3. So uh, that was the EMD convex. Uh, now let's have a look at uh, how to 
access uh, the EMD WARF on demand data. So this data is a calculation, so it's in the group called cluster services, and you see here the mesoscale data. So we simply start a calculation like that, and the interface uh, is very uh, similar to the one that you have to access the WASP CFD cluster service. Um, first we log in to the server, and then we select the point of interest, whether it's the site data object or the site mast. You can also press the button and select it on the map. So far you only get uh, a single point. And then you have the model configuration where you have two options, the uh, era interim, three kilometers, or mere globe cover, three kilometers resolution. Let's go with the era interim. And here you select the time period, and you can see that the required number of credits down here. And I would simply press start on server, and it'll tell me whether I have enough credits to do the calculation, and I can click OK, and I'll start the calculation and it will give me an estimated uh, time of completion. So um, once that's completed, I'll receive an email looking like this saying that my job has been completed and I can go in and open the calculation again. So I have a pre-run calculation here. Let's open it and have a look and you can see uh, download results. So I press download results and it will download my um, EMD WARF on demand time series. So it will also uh, establish a new layer as you see here where it will place the meadow object. So again now it's establishing the, the signals for the various heights. And I click OK. And so you see now I also have my, my EMD WARF data. So to update the EMD WARF uh, data uh, to a more recent period, you simply reopen the existing calculation and you choose the time period that you want and start it on server. And when you download it, it will automatically be added to your uh, existing material object. And so what I'm going to show you uh, finally here is how easy it is to use these mesoscale data in a downscaling. There are various options for doing the downscaling in WinPro 3, but the easiest one is uh, via the StatGen. And it's only possible because we've added this mesoscale uh, terrain and roughness in the middle object. So let's start the StatGen calculation. And you see now here at the front page there is a, an option to, to use the mesoterrain uh, from the middle object and we simply have to choose the height and because in this case we plug the mesoscale data directly into the WASP workflow uh, with the exception that we are using the actual mesoscale terrain and roughness and so we want to employ uh, WASP and if you choose a one of the um, highest heights you will let WASP do the um, the profile with the WASP stability model and that, that's what I recommend for, for using this that gen in the downscaling but all other steps will be exactly the same as in your standard uh, WASP calculation. You'll get away statistics which you can uh, use in the park calculation. Um, so this is a good alternative to using the old uh, win statistics from the European win or the uh, DVD or the Danish uh, win statistics. So with that, um, that's the, uh, the finish of the demonstration in, in WinPro. Of course, uh, I have to mention that uh, these, uh, these data uh, can be used in, in MCP, which is the, the, uh, the obvious and typical use. This downscaling is, is the new feature, and that's why I emphasize uh, this in this presentation. So let's talk a little more about uh, downscaling, because I think uh, there's a quite a bit of confusing to this term out there. So uh, what does it actually mean? Well, meteorological effects happen on a broad range of scales uh, out in the, in the real life. And typically, meteorological models only handle uh, a range of scales. So we have global scale models, mesoscale models, and microscale models. And so downscaling is the process of taking the output of one model 
and then combining it with uh, another model that predicts the effects at finer scales. So in this case, we're talking about taking the output from a mesoscale model, which also uses input from a global model, and then adds microscale effects predicted by a microscale model. So conceptually, downscaling is very similar to the WASP up and down, and that's why it's so easy to, you could say, do this easy downscaling via statgen. There are two main steps. So the first step is to uh, remove the effects of the coarse uh, mesoscale and terrain roughness at the grid point of interest. We call this step the standardization, and the result is a geostrophic wind or a wind statistics. It's very important to emphasize that for this step you need the terrain and roughness from the mesoscale model. And that's why I highlighted and this is why we included in the uh, EMD mesoscale uh, meteor objects. The second step is to apply the effects of the local microscale terrain and roughness valid for the wind turbine position. And this is, you could say, the actual downscaling part. So this is a well-established theory and there are uh, it's published in, 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 in many different uh, publications. I just list a few recent references down here. So, um, of course, this is the, uh, the, concept, the concept behind it. Uh, and I just showed you the very easy way of doing downscaling via Statian, where you rely on the ROSP approach with the wind statistics and uh, the viable fit. Um, However, there's also another way of uh, doing the downscaling in WinPro3, so that's what we call the EMD time series approach. There'll be much more about how you actually do that in WinPro in the webinar next week. So I'm just going to give you a little teaser about the theory behind it. So for this time series approach, there are some distinct uh, decisions. So first, obviously, we apply the downscaling uh, approach to each single time step of the mesoscale data, and another important distinction is that we let each model handle what it is best at, which means that we let the mesoscale model handle the stability, because there's a much more thorough description of the stability in the mesoscale model, and then we let the microscale model, which is WASP or WASP CFD, handle only the flow perturbations, so the effects of terrain speedups and roughness changes, and not include any of uh, the stability uh, perturbations from WASP. And so let's zoom a little more in on how this workflow actually is. So I've tried to illustrate this with this uh, with these following slides. So the starting point down here at the lower left is we have mesoscale uh, data. We have the wind speed and the direction at multiple heights. So that's the downloaded mesoscale meteor object. First step is that we interpolate to the uh, height of interest, so the hub height. And uh, next step is that we uh, remove the effects of varying terrain and roughness uh, the core, in the coarse mesoscale model, so that's simply uh, exemplified by dividing off the, the speed ups from terrain and roughness to get a wind speed rep which represents uniform conditions, so that's flat terrain and uniform roughness. Next step is to calculate the friction velocity and for that we need uh, something called the reference roughness, which is uh, the average roughness. And uh, last step going up is to calculate the geostrophic wind speed using the geostrophic drag law. Again, it uses the friction velocity and the, this reference roughness, which is the sector-wise average uh, roughness and also the Coriolis parameter. So then we have the geostrophic wind speed which we can then apply in the actual downscaling part. And that's what's going on here on the right side. So we take the geostrophic uh, wind speed, we apply it in the geostrophic drag law. But this time we know the geostrophic wind speed and we know the reference roughness, but this time it's blue because it represents the wind turbine position. And we want the friction velocity. So that's not an analytic, analytical solution, so it's done iteratively. And once we have the friction velocity, we can calculate the wind speed um, at uniform roughness and terrain and apply the microscale speed up factors for terrain and roughness variations. And the result is the downscaled uh, wind speed. 
uh, and direction. So this is the uh, flow of the uh, downscaling. Um, so um, enough about uh, downscaling. So let's have a look at uh, some validations for the EMD mesoscale data. So um, first I'd look at some of the uh, external validations. So last year at EVEA there were three publications evaluating the EMD convex data. And also this year, actually this week, uh, there's a publication uh, at EVEA Offshore also evaluating the data. So I'll just uh, highlight some, some of the conclusions from these studies, which were done uh, totally independent uh, of us. So two studies were based uh, in Greece and one uh, done by Equifus in, in, in Holland. So the first study concluded that for, for the, um, the masking in Greek, that the EMD convex data provided better correlation and lower standard deviation than, than MIA. And a similar conclusion in the other study from, from Greece, that the EMD convex data offers better correlation and lower standard deviation than the other data sets that they include in this study. And uh, at the end, this very thorough uh, Equifis study where they compared uh, mesoscale data from six of the uh, large mesoscale data providers. And their conclusion was that in terms of uh, correlation and bias, uh, all the six uh, data providers uh, provided uh, similar results. But when it came to the accuracy of the overall density, distribution, there was quite a big difference. And the wind speed distribution is, is very important to capture the, the energy right. And so they concluded that two out of the six models produced uh, consistently more accurate wind speeds. And, and EMD convex was, was one of these two. Um, enough about the external validation. So obviously, uh, before we reach that point, we have done a lot of internal validation. And uh, one main uh, steering tool in the development here at EMD is that we have a database of um, high quality masts, which is uh, growing all the time. So far we have uh, around 130 high quality masts measuring at around uh, 80 to 100 meters. And um, let's have a look at um, the performance of even the convex and EMD wall for this database. So first let's look at the correlations. <clears throat> So this is just the raw correlation, simply taking the overlapping uh, period and looking at the correlation coefficient. And so this is the uh, distribution for these uh, correlation coefficients. So you have the correlation coefficient down here at the x-axis and the, and the frequency. And you see that for the raw correlation for the mass within the EMD convex domain, we see, typically see correlation coefficients in the mid-80s. However, the raw correlation coefficient is very sensitive to very small um, misalignments in, in time. So, so, so often it makes sense also to evaluate the correlation at longer averaging periods. So let's, let's look at daily correlation coefficients. And you see now that that significantly uh, increases the correlation coefficient up to the, generally here the, in the mid-90s. And again, look going to monthly correlation, so that's the how well we capture the seasonal variation. See that the seasonal variation is, is captured extremely well for uh, actually uh, all mass we have in the in the high 90s in terms of correlation coefficient. So let's look at the uh, EMD warp. So that's all the mass in the database. Uh, we will apply the the on demand setup, and we see a, a similar picture, uh, slightly more spread because we have much more diverse mythological uh, um, effects going on uh, covering the entire globe. And but again, we see uh, a peak here in the in the mid 80s. Uh, going to daily correlations again, we shift towards uh, a peak here in the in the in the 90s, and again for the monthly correlation, we see uh, that the seasonal variation is captured very well. So just uh, a brief summary. <clears throat> so this is um, the expectation based on, on our analysis for the correlation coefficient. So for the EMD convex, we've seen on average correlations coefficients of uh, 83 percent and for EMD WARF uh, which includes uh, yeah, global coverage uh, slightly slightly lower but that's because that if you go outside Europe we have uh, quite a bit more challenging uh, methodology in, in, in several places um, so let's look at uh, how the downscaling performs so now it's it's more uh, downscaling doesn't really affect the correlation much but uh, in terms of the bias, how well can we predict the uh, the mean wind speed? 
So let's look first at the mask within the EMD uh, convex domain. So what I'm going to show you is the, how well the raw mesoscale data compares to uh, the measurements for the masks and how well the downscale results. And so the mean error, there's a negative bias if you use the, the raw mesoscale data and that's obvious that because it doesn't really account for the, the defined scale terrain speed up. But if you include the downscaling, and here IPZ means simply the, the standard WASP uh, terrain model and uh, a RICS because some of the sites are in complex terrain, we see that on average uh, the downscaling method is unbiased. So this is the, the time, uh, time series downscaling method in, in WinPro. So if we look at the mean absolute error, which is more similar to the standard deviation, we see that it's also reduced for the, uh, for the downscaling. It's not uh, as dramatic a uh, reduction. And of course, this indicates that although on average the downscaling is, uh, is not significantly biased, that for a particular site, you may expect some, some errors. And hence, it's good to have um, calibration data in terms of uh, reference wind turbines for calibration or some mast uh, in the region. Let's have a look at the bias results for the EMD wharf. <clears throat> Again, we see a similar picture that if you use the mesoscale data directly, there's a negative bias of so an under prediction of around 7%. If we include the standard downscaling setup, including RICS, we see on average that we are uh, spot on. Uh, but if you look at the mean absolute error, there's still some variation, which means that for the individual cases, there might be uh, some bias. So again, in conclusion here, that the downscaling actually, uh, if you look at the statistics, performs really well. It is not significantly biased, but for the individual cases, there is still to be expected some error, which, is, which can be addressed by... Um, by calibration, local calibration of the model using reference turbines. So um, that's it for the uh, presentation part. So uh, thanks for your attention. I look forward to, to answering some of your questions. And uh, back to you, Nathan. Thank you very much, Lassa. Okay, all of your questions have been received by Lassa. And there have been quite a few questions, as would be expected uh, on a topic of this nature. So we are going to give Lassa a second to go through the questions and see what he can answer during this Q&A session. In the time being, I would like to give you some information about how you can contact us uh, for more information and to order credits uh, concerning mesoscale data and mesoscale calculations. You can see there on your screen, um, as per usual, all of our manuals, best practices, and information can be found on the knowledge base portion of our website. If you would like to order mesoscale calculation credits, you can do so uh, by ordering on our website there at the link you see just below the center of your screen. You can also email sales at sales at emd.dk or call them at the number you see there about the middle of your screen. If you have uh, technical questions, please forward those to our tech support hotline uh, by writing an email to support at emd.dk and someone will get back to you uh, very quickly. So I think now I will hand it back over to Lassa to take a few of your questions. And again, I'd like to remind you that, and there have been a lot of questions, so I would like to remind you that if Lassa does not get to your question, uh, it will be included in the summary. We are going to make a summary of all questions that should be available on the website tomorrow, and you will receive an email with a link to the uh, Q&A summary and to the webinar. So here you go, Lassa. Thank you, Nathan, and uh, thank you all for the uh, highly relevant questions. So uh, I think I'll be uh, able to answer a, a handful of those. So one question here is, uh, can the EMD WAF be scaled to exact required coordinates, or it, is it just available nodes? Well, since it's on demand, the EMD WAF, and you select your point of interest, you will get the metro object for exactly that point. So. The answer to this question is yes, you will get exactly the point that you request because when you start the calculation, you define how the grid should be placed. Um, let's see here, there's another question. Do I need a license for EMD convex uh, to be able to order EMD wharf data? No, and the question is no. 
you don't need uh, a license to EMD Convex to use the EMD on demand um, service. What you need is uh, prepaid uh, calculation credits. So that's the only pre-requirement for the uh, for the EMD Wharf um, on demand service. And then there's another uh, very good question here. Could we use any other mesoscale data than the ones provided by EMD in WinPro and use Statian for downscaling? And the question, uh, the, the answer here is no. For this very easy uh, downloading via Statian, you cannot use other data than, uh, the, um, than the EMD mesoscale data. And the reason is that I don't know of any other mesoscale uh, providers that include the uh, roughness and mesoscale uh, information. But what you can do if you go to the time-dependent downscaling, which you would see more about in the webinar next week, you can actually do what we call a more simple downscaling using mesoscale data from other providers. But you have to keep in mind that the result will not be as accurate because you don't know the starting point, you don't know the terrain and roughness that was used and hence you cannot remove the effects uh, of those models. And so that's a big limitation of using um, mesoscale data without uh, that information available. Um, and there's another question here. Could you show us the mesoscale terrain downloaded, please? Well, <clears throat> I'll not show it to you, but I'll tell you that it's very easy. You can, uh, directly from the Metro object, you can choose to add it uh, as a result layer, and you can evaluate it uh, there. So it's, uh, we don't try to hide it. You can, you can have a look at it. I think if you open the tab, uh, you, you'll be able to see um, um, quite easily uh, that that it's easy to access and um, is the EMD convex product the same data as the EMD wharf well uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I fully understand uh, the question but I guess if I try to rephrase it is that if I do the EMD wharf uh, for a, a EMD convex data grid point, will I get exactly identical data? And no, uh, you will not. First of all, uh, the domains are different uh, because in the EMD convex is calculated for a very large domain uh, and uh, also because the um, EMD WARF, we have made some optimizations which will generally mean that you would see slightly higher correlation coefficients for the EMD WARF uh, for the raw correlation. As you go to uh, just a little bit of averaging, you will typically not see a, a big difference. So, in general, they will not be fully identical, but they will be uh, quite consistent. So, let's see maybe just a, uh, a short question here. How about changing mesoscale model parameterizations? And you're right, in the, it's no secret that we use the WARF model um, in the setup, and there are much, many more choices than, than we have open to you and so far we only allow the decision of uh, between the global boundary data. Uh, we might provide more options later on but uh, we have made a lot of benchmarks and so uh, we are quite confident that the setup that we provide is competitive um, and we would be less certain about that if we had included more options. Um, and so uh, I think this uh, concludes it uh, with the time that we have available and uh, I will get to the remaining questions in writing and you can see those later on. I think Nathan will explain uh, how that works. So thank you for the very good questions and uh, back to you Nathan. Okay, thank you very much Lasse. I appreciate uh, the effort in answering as many questions as possible. Uh, that is time for today's webinar on the Mesoscale data in WinPro 3.0. Um, when, when the webinar ends, uh, a close button will pop up in your GoTo interface. Uh, please press that button and the survey will open in your web browser. It is a very, very short survey that will not take more than literally about 30 seconds of your time, just five questions. Uh, and at the end of that, you will have the ability to request 12 free credits, which are good for one year, 
of EMD WARF on-demand mesoscale data in WinPro 3.0 so that you can evaluate it for yourself. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the webinar and please look forward to some more information from us uh, in the next, well coming tomorrow in an email that will include the link to the recording of this webinar as well as the Q&A summary of all questions that you've submitted and that will be available tomorrow. Um, so have a good day, evening or night and thanks a lot for your time and attention.